Let me read to you a passage from the fifth chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel, verses 17 to 19. It's the Gospel for Wednesday of the third week in Lent. <clears throat> St. Matthew writes, Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth. Until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever puts into practice and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. That's from Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 to 19. What does it suggest to us? Well, it suggests the importance of acting, doing, rather than just thinking in the matter of religion. You know, prior to his election as Pope, John Paul II's primary academic discipline was philosophy, although he had published in theology and letters as well, drama and poetry. Within philosophy, he worked within a school of thought that combined Thomism and modern phenomenology, as developed in a special way at the University of Lublin, Poland, where he taught prior to his becoming Archbishop of Krakow. His principal philosophical work, translated into English from the original Polish, was The Acting Person. In that book he stressed the paramount importance of the act, as opposed to, say, mere thought. It is not merely man's thoughts, but his acts that define him and set his course. Indeed, it is his action that manifests his real thought, and it is his action that naturally takes him beyond himself in a form of self-transcendence. Man finds himself to be not just a self that thinks, but a self that acts in and on the world. Now, one philosophical advantage of this approach is that if the human act, rather than mere human thought, is the starting point of one's account of man, then while man's thought is included in his action, the Cartesian isolation of the thinking self from the world is avoided. Modifying Descartes' famous first principle that brought so many, so many problems to philosophy, we may say, I act, therefore I am, rather than what Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. Now be all this as it, as it may, my point in dwelling upon a philosophy that lays primary stress on human action, is that it surely prepares us for our Lord's own stress on action. It's not just what we think that makes all the difference, although what we think does matter a great deal, but it is more what we do about it that will matter so much more. We think of our Lord himself, who came not as, say, another Socrates, although, as we remember, his disciples came to think that he knew all things. Socrates, the thinker, could not, as we might say, hold a candle to him. But more than anything, he came not merely as a master of thought, but as one who did the greatest of works, and at immense cost to himself. The Son of God came among us to act, to take away the sin of the world. He came, he says in today's Gospel, to fulfil the law and the prophets. It was a matter of doing, of action. And so it is that it is not enough to know and think of the commandments of God. Christ counts as great the man who obeys them and teaches others to obey them. It is action, deeds, obedience that Christ expects. He wants us to, to conform our lives to what we know to be right. And this we do not just by 
thinking about what is right, but by acting on what is right. Cardinal Newman once wrote that the essence of religion lies in authority and obedience. He was countering the liberal and relativistic view of religion, which made one's private judgment and free opinion the fundamental principle. Nevertheless, his statement has a wider relevance. A religion of God's authority and man's obedience is one that places the stress on what we do, rather than just what we think. As we heard our Lord say, anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever puts into practice and teaches these commands will be great in the kingdom of heaven. This stress on active obedience, involving, for instance, a profoundly moral life, is a most notable characteristic of revealed religion. The prophets invade against a religion of sacrifices and holocausts while neglecting and indeed violating justice and mercy. And our Lord criticised the scribes and the Pharisees for a similar defect in their religion. He said to his disciples that it is not those who say to me, Lord, Lord, who will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. He contrasted the foolish man with the sensible man. The foolish man, the one who hears the word but fails to do it, has built his house on sand. The sensible man, the one who hears and obeys the will of God, has built his house on rock. He stands, whatever be the rains and the floods. His is a religion that endures because what counts in his life is that he do what God wants of him and not just say, know it. He does not neglect to the all-important business of action. Every day he rises from his rest in order to act, to do the work, to fulfil the duty that God is asking of him. The saint is a person who does what God expects of him. Of course, we must understand action broadly, which is to say, in a sense that includes all of man's acting. The acting person is the person whose action embraces praying, recreating, and the myriad forms of serving, but who in his acts is, revo- is resolved to do whatever is right, even at the cost of his life. That is why Jesus Christ is the man par excellence. He acted, and in his acts he did what pleased the Father. Cardinal Newman understood the conscience to be the most distinctive faculty of man's mind. And what is the conscience? The conscience reveals what a person is called to do. It obliges him to act in a certain way. In God's plan, the the acting person strives to know the will of God and puts it into practice. If we do this, we flourish as human beings and and are on the path to glory.